Yes, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yes, very much. Please go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Rashmi Pawar, second semester student of uh, English department. Uh, if you talk to a man in a language, he understands. That goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. A uh, well said by Nelson Mandela. Uh, with this uh, good quote, uh, we'll go ahead. I welcome on behalf of uh, Director Radhi Chanama University, PG Center, Vijaypur, and uh, our coordinator of the Department of Studies and uh, Research in English, Dr. Fayaz Ahmad Ilkal, sir, for this special lecture by Dr. Arindan Kundu, Assistant Professor, Shri Shri University, Odisha. Welcome, sir. I also welcome coordinator for the Department of Studies and Research in English, a local head, as well as a president of today's function. I also thank him for uh, inviting the resource person on these topics, uh, which will definitely will be beneficial for the students. I also welcome our teaching assistants Rakesh Wagmure, sir, Ruksana, madam, and uh, also welcome to our uh, seniors and my classmates and other university students and all uh, dignitaries. And now, without further order, I request our teaching assistant, uh, Rakesh Wagmure, sir, to introduce the speaker. Over to you, sir. Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, sir, very much. Sir, uh, before you begin, I would like to just introduce Rakesh uh, to Rindan Kundu. And he, he is a product of Central University Gulbarga, sir. Okay. Uh, he has studied under Nagaraju and then uh, Basaraj Donur. And then uh, from 2017, he is associated with me. He's working uh, and uh, helping me in running the department. Uh, sorry, once again, I would like to bring to you a kind notice that I have, though I have been appointed in Rani Chinna Ministry, but I have been a deputed to Postgraduate Center at Bijapur. Oh, okay. Vijaypur, which has been renamed as Vijaypur, and Vijaypur has one more university, that is Karnatak State Women's University, which has been renamed as Akka Mahadevi Women's University. Akka Mahadevi is a sage, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a renowned sage from uh, Karnataka, this part. So it is named, uh, named against her, and uh, he is a specially abled teaching assistant, and continuously he has cracked seven to eight net exam net continuously exam. in pursuit in the pursuit of clearing JRF, but uh, he is falling short by one, uh, two, or four marks. Uh, inshallah, this time he will uh, clear it. So, with this brief okay. introduction about my teaching assistant, who is a motivation to all of us. Over to you, Rakesh. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Yes. Uh, good. Very good afternoon to you all. I convey my thanks to our HOD, Dr. Fayaz Ilkal, sir, for organizing uh, this fabulous lecture, which is going to be enlightened us as well as our students. Uh, I personally feel it's my proud privilege to introduce this distinguished guest of to, uh, today's speaker. Students, you know, today's guest is in, uh, indeed he is an outstanding and great academic intellectual scholar. That's, uh, that is Rind Rindan Kundu, sir, who is working as an assistant professor, faculty, faculty arts communication and Indic studies, Sri Sri University, Odisha. Sir is also 
uh, recently he has been appointed as director director of sri sri uh, center for translation and interpret ఉండి <laughs> He has recently been appointed as the founder director of Tri Shri Center for Translation and Interpreting Studies. He has been elected as a treasurer of the Comparative Literature Association of India and I would also like to uh, request Rindan sir to share all the details about uh, uh, getting a membership for this you uh, not only to my teaching assistants but even to my students also so that it, they can be a part of this uh, association and then he is pursuing phd i hope you have submitted right rendu no no Still not yet okay okay we okay. wish you all the best yeah uh, he is pursuing phd from the department of comparative literature jadavpur university and had been ugc junior and senior research fellow that is jrf and uh, srf to joining ssu he completed his mphil in translation studies from center for applied linguistics and translation studies university of hyderabad india in uh, 2014 he has uh, recently been selected for Volkswagen Stiftung 2021 grant and one more friend uh, sayan de he has also been uh, uh, he is also a recipient of this fellowship mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he has also been awarded several international grants like est 2019 young research travel grant by the european society for translation and uh, studies to present his research on british academy 2019 full grant awardee to participate in the african translation and interpreting studies writing workshop in serenbos university south africa and sixth iitis bursary award 2018 by the international association of translation and intercultural studies to present a paper in hong kong baptist university hong kong he was invited to deliver a plenary presentation at the sixth international symposium on ecological translation organized by zengzhou university pr china and recently been invited by Brit- british center for literary translation University of East Anglia to talk at the BCLT conference on eco translation responding to the work of Michel Cronin so with this brief introduction i once again welcome rindan and then this class is open for you please take over uh first of all thank you rashmi for this warm welcome thank you rakesh for this warm introduction and i wish you all the best in your future both of you i am sure that you will do best and uh, lastly thank you to dr ilkal my long time friend and uh, for you know inviting me to this platform i am really you know fortunate enough to be invited by two universities i didn't know about it uh and uh, i i am hoping that i'll you know i'll be able to visit physically uh hopefully next year yeah, definitely I, i won't leave and, you i will definitely drag you here <laughs> and also i i welcome all of you to this beautiful part of india odisha this you know my university is, has a very beautiful campus at the bank of river mahanadi just beside mahanadi river okay uh, so today as you know you all know that uh, we we will be talking about translation and uh, translation from the western perspective as well as indian perspective before i begin uh, dr ilkal may i know how much time do i have in total yeah there is no limitation sir 
Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. And uh, this Zoom doesn't have a limitation. I have to subscribe for this. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I please, you know, ask you to uh, able. Yeah, you want you know, to share your this, screen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, now, sir? Uh, yes. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Make it uh, show. Run it in show mode. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, before I begin the concept of translation, let me start with a few definitions of translation given by different, you know, scholars over the time. And uh, the first, you know, definition that I have picked up is by, given by Vinay and Jarbalnet. And they are talking that the concept of translation or the act of translation is actually the passage from language A to language B to express the same reality. Now we all know that this language A has been termed as source language and language B has been termed as target language. So according to Vinay, Jean-Paul Vinay and Jen Darbelnet, these two scholars together, they are saying that translation is actually the passage from language A to language B to express the same reality. So please, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, you know, concentrate on these two terms. Number one, this concept of passage from one language to the other, and the purpose of translation, according to Vinay and Darbalnet, is to express the same reality. Number two, Roger Bell, 1987, he is saying that translation is actually the process whereby a translator decodes a message from a text in the source language and re-encodes the message into the target language. Look at these two ideas. Number one, Vinay and Arbanet is talking about translation as the passage. Roger Bell is saying translation is actually a process, a process where a translator is taking an active role and he is actually decoding a message from the source text and then re-encoding the message into the target language. I will describe all these concepts later, but just for the beginning, I'm just you know, introducing you different concepts of translation. I will talk about this decoding, recoding later. Number three, Danica Selekovic, 1976, and uh, he say, she is saying that you know translation is actually is a process which is meant to communicate the meaning of the original message. So look at this you know this particular definition of translation is actually introducing the communicative aspect of translation. It is saying that the purpose of translation is to communicate to communicate the message of the original. Then J.C. Catford, a well-known linguist, 1965, and he is saying that translation is actually a replacement of the textual material in one language, that is source language, by the equivalent textual material in another language, that is target language. I will discuss this concept of equivalence also after I describe all these uh, definitions, because you know the first Western theory uh, is equivalence, and I will you know in, in detail I will talk about it. But in this particular definition, the important thing to note is that J.C. Catford is talking about a kind of replacement of the textual material. So he is talking about that translation is a process where there is a kind of 
displacement and then replacement happening so it is a kind of an action which is closely associated with the concept of space and that is space and place that is why the replacement displacement all these you know terminologies are coming into it then 1969 christian and ide and tabor he is you know close associate these two uh, sorry sorry I, i my mistake eugene and ide and his close associate tabor these two scholars together they worked on a book called towards a translation towards the science of translation and eugene and ide famous linguist uh you know a, a bible translator he has said that the concept of translation is actually to reproduce in the receptor language the closest natural equivalence of the source language message so you can see that both eugene and ide and jc catford they are talking about this concept called equivalence okay and these scholars are actually coming from equivalence school of translation studies i will as i have said that i will talk about them but in this particular definition nida is talking about reproduction translation as reproduction so according to this you know uh, uh, definition the source language text is a production produced by the writer and then the translator is reproducing the same text as close as possible to the target language so there is a there, there is a process of reproduction associated with translation basil hatim and mason two scholars together 1990 they are saying that translation is a communicative process taking place within a social context now this communicative process we have just heard in the last slide deneka selakovic is talking about translation as communication but basil hatim what he and mason together they are introducing in this particular definition is that translation is also having a social context without society without understanding the society we cannot understand translation and later we will see that how this concept of taking social context and cultural context into the process has actually kind of you know uh, made translation to take a cultural turn later a sociological turn a lot of turn came into translation studies but it started with all these you know definitions then katharina reis and vermeer uh these two you know scholars uh vermeer is actually uh, the founder of scopos theory s k o p o s and after you know discussing equivalence i will come to this theory so vermeer and his translator katharina reis from german to english together they have proposed a theory called scopos uh right now we will you know uh, translate this german term scopos as purpose so katharina reis and vermeer they are saying that the dominant principle in any process of transfer in any process of translation is the purpose why a translator is translating that is the sole important point to be understood in the process of translation the purpose the why factor and lastly christiana nord the uh, you know he she too comes from the scopos uh, school she is saying that translation is a communicative process and there is a function uh, you know that is there in translation translation has to play its function in the target society a translator is translating because he wants he or she wants a text to function in certain way in the target society so i i'm i'm going back to the the to the last slide 
So in the first definition, we have understood that translation is actually a passage from one language to the other one, uh, to, from language A to language B. Second definition is saying the translation is a process where there is a kind of encoding and decoding. Then the third uh, you know, uh, definition is saying the translation is meant to communicate the original message. The fourth definition is saying that there is a kind of replacement happening in translation. So translation has a kind of spatial nature, is, is, a, is a process which is closely associated with place and space. Then Christian and Ida is saying that translation is also a process of reproduction. Then Basil Hatim and J. Mason, they are saying that translation is a communication, but it is also taking place in a social context. So without understanding the society, both source society and the target society, source culture and the target culture, we will not understand the translation. Katharina Reyes is saying that there is a kind of purpose that is there embedded in the process of translation. And lastly, Christian Anod is saying that translation has a function to play in the society. It's a communicative process, but it has also a function to play. Now, I'm not saying that these are all, you know, the only definitions available on translation. I have just picked up some of them. There are umpteen number of definitions available on, you know, internet, et cetera, you can also check. But I have just, you know, taken some of the examples in order to understand the translation from different points of view. Now, as we know, the process of translation, there are two things associated. One is that how to translate the meaning of the source text into the target language, keeping the style intact. Now, this is something that is the most difficult thing to do in any kind of translation, especially poetry. So whether, you know, how you will maintain the form, the style of the source text into the target language and how you will keep intact the meaning. And then there is a, you know, the, this problem will come that how much you can differ, a translator can differ from the source text in terms of meaning and style, how much he can adapt according to his or her own interpretation, how much he can adapt as per the social reality of the target language, how much he can adapt in terms of the linguistics, sorry, linguistical value of the source a target language. But translation, you know, it's it's a combination of meaning and style because most often we think translation from the textual point of view and today's lecture will take translation from the textual point of view only. I will not discuss any other kind of translation, though there are other kinds of translation, say for example, medical translation, machine translation, and uh, you know, sociological translation, ecological translation, et cetera, et cetera. But today, since you know this is uh, not a lecture meant for the literature students, so we will consider translation from one text to the other. And since we are thinking translation in terms of that, therefore there is a meaning and style which a translator has to, in general, it, it's our you know, uh, conceptual understanding that translator should maintain meaning and style, meaning and form as much as possible. But I'll discuss you know, later that what is the problem of thinking in terms of this orthodox nature that a translator cannot deviate from the source. Now come back to this word translation. Let us you know, dissect the word translation. Now, in generally, if I ask you that what is the meaning of the word translation, you all will say, sir, translation is actually, you know, when we are translating one text to our own language or when we are translating our own language text into other language. But believe it or not, in 12th century, the word translation was actually meant something else. And this word actually directly came from the Latin word translationem. 
and in mid 12th century that meant carrying across transfer of meaning removal transporting now interestingly this particular you know word translation in 14th century it meant rendering of a text from one language to the other, another so this idea of you know rendering of a text translating a text from one language to the other was not there before 14th century translation meant something else before 14th century and as i have said the word translation you can check you know chambers etymological dictionary or claims dictionary or etym online website you will see that there is an interesting meaning of the word translation in 12th century to translate meant in 12th century removal of a saint's relic removal of a saint's relic or body from one place to the other there is a you know there is an essay by talal asad which was you know uh, collected in the book between languages and uh, be between languages and cultures edited by anuradha dingwane and carole meyer where you know where there is a text there is a uh, essay by uh, talal asad i just forgot the name of the essay talal asad is actually the first person to talk about this particular meaning of translation before him nobody has said about it and he is saying by excavating the etymological root of the word translation he is saying that the word translation in 12th century meant removal of body from one place to the other body in the sense saints body not anyone's body or removal of a saint's relic from one place to the other now there are two things that you need to understand number one so there is a body or relic that is transferred that is being transferred from one place to the other it was there in 12th century secondly when you are transferring a saint's relic or body you cannot change it you cannot tamper it because it's a religious thing and you know that in christianity this is extremely important that you know in, i i i'm not very sure but i i know that there is a church in kerala which has some important saints you know body part preserved into it so this you know transference of body parts of saints was a very important thing in christianity and that is why there is a kind of close connection of this act of translation and bible study i am not going into it but just for reference you know that william tyndall was burnt alive because he translated latin bible in english why it was meant as a, it was treated as a act of heresy because of this you know talal asad actually traced this origin why the 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 you know the western scholars or the or, or all the scholars you know uh, especially the scholars who are extremely associated with bible translation etc they always think that we need to keep the original as much as possible even if it does not mean anything in the target language even if the target language syntax does not match with the original but we need to keep the meaning and the form intact because it's god's word you cannot change now talal asad has actually traced a uh, kind of equated this idea with this etymological understanding of translation in 12th century as i have said transference of body saints body from one place to the other now i hope that this particular idea of you know uh, uh, keeping the saints relic intact as much as possible is clear now come to the other idea look there is a kind of transference that is talking about and we know in 14th century the meaning changed the, the meaning of the word translation changed into transference of meaning from one text to the other now what is the connection in between there is a connection the connection is 
first of all both these meanings 12th century meaning transference of saints body 14th century meaning transference of meaning they both are talking about an an act of transference and if we uh, you know uh, kind of excavate the word transmigration transference translation we will see that all these words are coming from the same root to fair and to and and this word lesio translation lesio and fair is actually they both you know meaning carrying over to copy another important point is that there is a spatial movement that is there in translation say for example think about you know my left hand as the source text they you know treat it as a book or just a, just a minute okay i have two books now treat this as the source text right now say that you know dr elkal asked all of you and you know to do an assignment he asked that okay you translate this book into kannada now can you translate you know this book on this particular book no right you need another space so you will look to this book you will transfer the meaning but where will you write you need another space another blank space you cannot write on the same book so you will choose treat this as a notebook now look how the meaning is getting transferred from one space as you know that i hope that you remember all your class 10 basic physics that everything is you know occupying a three dimensional space this book is also having a three dimensional space occupying now meaning is getting transferred from this space to this space translation please remember i hope that you will never forget this thing translation the western concept of translation is a spatial metaphor spatial s p a t i a l s p a t i a l spatial comes from space western concept of translation is very much associated with the concept of space and that is why in all the meaning in sorry in all the definitions we have seen that they are talking about place space etc transfer transpose transmigrate all these terms which are related to space so source text target text meaning are getting transferred within one space to the other is that clear i hope that th this thing is clear and you will never forget that the western concept is a spatial metaphor and this is one of the main difference i will talk about this again when i will start the indian concept that it is one of the basic difference between the western concept of translation and indian notion of translation i am not talking about indian notion right now i am reserving it after i finish western concept but please remember western concept of translation is a spatial metaphor is related to space okay now i'm not going into this you all know the translation is actually you know there is a different languages and cultures involved it's a communicative it has a communicative purpose there is target audience or target reader and there is a purpose for which a translator is translating now i will start with cicero i hope that you all have read since you know in the cbc syllabus you all are having now classical european literature so you all have heard about this gentleman cicero 46 bc and he has said about two important definitions and please look at this slide you can take screenshot whatever i do not have any it it is published it is there on website so i don't mind but look at these two ideas word for word and sense for sense written in blue now please remember that cicero 46 bc this famous roman uh, scholar 
he is the first one to talk about this primary division of translation methodology okay how we do translate he is the first person in, from the western point of view who has talked about two important methodological di distinctions between the act uh, in the act of translation and he is saying that word for word is a, a is a way to translate the another way is sense for sense and believe it or not this particular idea is actually we we still didn't come out of this particular idea we still are discussing you will you'll be surprised that the last book as far as i know uh, by anthony pim published on this idea in 2010 so from 46 bc till 2010 and then even uh, you know i'm sure that you know uh, scholars are also working on this even now this particular thing has not been resolved that which way i will take okay will i take will i translate word for word will i translate literally close to the text source text or should i go for sense for sense more liberal kind of translation so whether i will choose the literal path or the liberal path is still a problem Cicero is the first person to understand these primary distinctions between methodologies. And he has said word for word and sense for sense. And he said that word for word is nothing but the replacement of each individual word of source text with its closest grammatical equivalent in target text. And since, as you know, that the entire Roman civilization was heavily dependent on Greek civilization, they were translating heavily from Greek texts. Therefore, for Cicero, as a Roman scholar who is associated with you know, active translation, for him, source text is Greek, target text is Latin, because that is all they are doing. Another way, according to Cicero, is sense for sense where you are thinking about how you can you, you can you know kind of move the listeners how you can attract the reader and the reader will feel more the, the target text more akin to his or her experience so therefore the translator is giving more importance to the target reader to the target culture to the target language and that, according to Cicero, is sense for sense. And Cicero has also, in order to understand this, you need to understand the Roman culture of that time. There were two professions. One is interpreter, the other one is orator. As you know that, you know, Julius Caesar, sorry, sorry, my mistake. Alexander was a great orator who went to Aristotle Academy to, under, to, to learn oratory. Auditory was such a, an important thing in, in Greece and in, in, in Rome also. Now, another scholar, Horace, you also have heard about Horace because you all have read Odes, Horatian Odes, personal Odes. Now, this person has also talked about translation and he, just like Cicero, has talked about the same distinctions, say, word for word and sense for sense. And I will just, you know, uh, quote from Horace, and then I will clarify these two, uh, you know, important theoreticians on translation. So Horace is saying a theme that is familiar can be made your own property so long as you do not waste your time on a hackneyed treatment, nor should you try to render your original word for word like a slavish translator or in imitating another writer slant yourself into difficulties from which shame or the rules you have laid down for yourself prevent you from extricating yourself so what does he you know want to say like cicero first of all he has categorized the act of translation into two one is as i have told word for word the other was sense for sense 
And both Cicero, and I have not told uh, when I was discussing Cicero because I am waiting for uh, Horace. Both Cicero and Horace, they preferred sense for sense translation. Look at this quote carefully. Horace is saying that if you are translating word for word, then you are nothing but a slave of the writer. You cannot tell your, you cannot, you know, project yourself as an individual. You are, you are nothing but a slavish translator. You are a slave. You do not have any agency. You do not have any subjectivity to talk about. To, to, you know, if you are just copying from and replacing the word in your, uh, from your language, you are nothing but a copier, a slave. And therefore, both of them, Cicero and Horace, both of them advocated for word, sorry, sorry, advocated for sense for sense translation. Because according to them, your, the, the translator subjectivity can only be highlighted through sense for sense translation. When the translator is actually applying the his or her subjectivity, his or her understanding and rendering the source text in his or her own language, in his or her own interpretation into the target. Therefore, we can see that there is a two way, you know, distinction. One is the literal side source language towards source language, which we say source language bias. If we if you translate word for word, then the translator will be termed as a biased translator towards source language. But you, if you are translating sense for sense, which is liberal translation, then you will be called that you are target, you are biased towards target language, target reader, target culture. So you can see that this balanced, this middle, I and I have not pointed anything on this particular uh, you know, picture. Why? Because there is no point called balanced. Either you will be tilted towards the source language or the target language. There is no middle, exact middle. There is no, uh, you know, perfect translation that has used 50% of literal, 50% of liberal. There is no such thing because it is a human action. Okay. Now come to Dryden and I am sure that you all have read Dryden. He is one of the most important writer in the history of English literature. Now you also, I, I'm sure that you also know that Dryden was a translator and Dryden translated heavily the classical European literature. And one of the texts that he has chosen to translate is Ovid's epistles. And in the preface of Ovid's epistles, he has categorized translation into three ways. Now, why all of a sudden there are, uh, you don't think that after Cicero and Horace, he is the first person to talk about translation. It is not that I have just chosen some of the important, you know, war, uh, uh, translators or theoreticians. But why I have chosen Dryden? Because Dryden is the first person in the history of Western translation studies who has tried to come out this bipartite, you know, the, the kind of, you know, dialectical understanding of translation act. He's the first person to introduce tripartite act of translation, the understanding of translation. And he has talked about three ways of translation. One is metaphrase, M-E-T-A-P-H-R-A-C, metaphrase, or as Dryden is you know, himself saying, metaphrase is actually turning an author word by word, line by line from one language into another. So we can say that metaphrase is actually Cicero's idea of word for word translation. Now the second word, paraphrase, P-A-R-A-P-H-R-A-S-E. As Dryden is himself illuminating the word, that it is actually the Ciceronian sense for sense view of translation. 
okay where you are translating in terms understanding the sense of the source text now that last one that is imitation now before i explain this word please remember that this word imitation the meaning that we know now in 21st century or 20th century or 19th century was not there in 17th century okay the term imitation was you know meant something else from you know it it was completely different from what we know now so please do not get confused from the meaning that dryden is you know talking about imitation according to him the third way of translation is imitation where the translator can abandon the text of the original as he sees fit so we can say that imitation in terms of dryden from the point of view of dryden is actually adaptation from the modern point of view where the translator can completely abandon the text of the original and can adapt the text in the target culture as he sees fit now amongst the three which one was dryden's preferable you know methodology it is paraphrase dryden advocated for sense for sense so he has taken a kind of middle path between complete deviance from the source text to the complete obeyance of the source to the source text so he has kind of taken a middle path between word for word and adaptation completely free according to him sense for sense is that middle ground i'm really sorry that i am you know changing from one idea to the other very quickly but i need to finish a huge area in one lecture so no 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 issue please... sir and then you are going to very well uh, these okay. are the very basic information which is and and i i know. yeah and if you want i can you know send these slides i don't yes, have please. any issue yes please okay. yes please you can do that okay uh now the the next you know uh uh the theorist the the pronunciation is little difficult the pronunciation is frederick schleiermacher is c h l e i e r m a c h e r now this person has written a very important text which we consider as one of the greatest essays written in translation studies and till date we all are working on it okay schleiermacher has talked about two concept again he went back to this you know ciceronian and horatian idea of sense for sense and word for word but he has introduced something new according to schleiermacher there are two ways possible one is alienation the other one is naturalization what is alienation and what is naturalization i will you know read this uh, definition later let me clarify say for example you all have read shakespeare right now there can be two ways of translating shakespeare in any indian languages number 1 say for example that a kannada translator or an any indian language translator is translating shakespeare word for word literally and the other way is he is translating sense for sense according to schleiermacher when a translator is translating word by word he is actually moving the he is actually moving the reader towards shakespeare say for example think about macbeth and think that you know you the, a, a kannada translator has translated word by word this idea of thane t h a n e 
or he has you know translated all the characters as it is so you are right you are reading macbeth lady macbeth in kannada now you know that macbeth this name is not there in any kannada family so you know that it this is uh, not from your culture you also know that all these you know historical background of you know this scotland and etc is not your background so therefore what you have to read as a reader you have to know the culture of shakespearean uh, uh, sorry of of scotland you have to know you have to understand the way shakespeare wrote you have to know about elizabethan theater so therefore look how much the reader has to toil in terms of understanding the source text so according to schleiermacher when a translator is translating word by word literal kind of a translator a translation then the reader is actually the translator is taking the reader along with him to the writer's home you need to understand europe you need to understand that elizabethan england so you are traveling from karnataka to england in terms of you know through your reading and you need to understand your your uh, sorry you need to understand that that time the, the the time that when shakespeare wrote according to schleiermacher this is called alienation when you the reader is understanding that what he or she is reading is about an alien culture is an alien text now just imagine that i am not very sure about you know shakespearean translation in kannada but for an example i am giving an example from bengali so there is you know a, a play is it, it the name of the play is hemlat prince of goranhata it's a play in bengal now you can understand easily that hemlat you know it can be a bengali name and goranhata is a place in bengal so a person who is watching this play or reading the text will think that it is a bengali original he will not understand that this is a translation of a shakespearean play from an other, another time from another space here according to schleiermacher the translator is taking shakespeare the author to the readers home now shakespeare has to come to bengal in order to understand the translation the reader does not have to go to england the reader is thinking that it is a kind of an original text even if he knows he or she knows that it's an it's a translation even then he or she does not have to work hard in order to understand or think about this uh, famous you know uh, uh, bollywood movie uh, makbool which is an adaptation of Mac uh, macbeth or say you know uh, this adaptation of othello omkara or the adaptation of hamlet as haider the the you know that this film makbool has been adapted in bombay underworld you know that this play hamlet has been adapted to kashmir politics so therefore now it is shakespeare's onus in order to understand these adaptation he has to come to kashmir or bombay and understand these ideas but when you are reading in kannada the exact word for word translation you are thinking Yeah, so you have to read all these cultural aspects tropes of shakespearean time so the second way of translation according to schleiermacher he has termed it as naturalization where you are naturalizing the translation in the target culture where the reader can feel at home while reading or watching the text now i will read the definition by schleiermacher so schleiermacher is saying either the translator leaves the writer in peace as much as possible and moves the reader towards him it is alienation or he leaves the reader in peace as much as possible 
and moves the writer toward him. It is naturalization. I hope that this is now clear. And you can see that this is nothing but a kind of rewording of this Ciceronian idea of word for word and sense for sense from a different angle. Now I will come to this equivalence in translation. We have talked about equivalence, believe it or not, we have actually finished almost you know, 60% of the equivalence theory. I will talk about now the entire idea. Equivalence in translation studies is actually based on this very basic idea of dividing translational action into two word for word and sense for sense. And equivalence in translation studies does not mean that it's a relationship between, uh, sorry, it's a relationship of equal value between the source text and the target text. Equivalence has always posited a relationship of equal value or sameness. It is not talking, it is not saying that, you know, these, the, the target text has to be carbon copy of the source. It is saying that the target text should be similar to the source text. Now, I hope that you can see this picture of a pipe. Now, it's a very interesting idea of translation. If I ask you what it is, you all will say that, sir, it's a pipe, but it's not a pipe that is written in French. And it's not a pipe. So what is it? It's a picture of pipe. Now, this is one thing that we always, you know, the, you know, commits a mistake when we are thinking about translation. When you are reading the Kannada version of Shakespeare, you are thinking that you are reading Shakespeare, but you are not reading Shakespeare. You are reading Kannada translation of Shakespeare. So you are actually reading that Kannada translator's representation of Shakespeare in Kannada language. But it will be posed in such a way in front of you, in front of the reader, that the reader will think that, okay, I'm reading Shakespeare. Say, for example, we all have read Camus, we all have read, you know, Kafka, Chekhov, but, or, or Aristotle, or, you know, uh, Kalidas. But are we reading Kalidas in Sanskrit? Are we reading Aristotle in Greek? Are we reading Chekhov in Russian? Are we reading Kafka in German or Kamu in French? No. But we are saying that we are, we, I have read Kamu's, you know, uh, L'Etranger, uh, the, the Outsider. But actually you have read the translator's version of Kamu. You all know that Milena, uh, the famous translator of Kafka. And there is a book, Milena's Kafka. So how the translator has represented the author. But when we are reading text in translation, we often forget that we are reading the translation, not the original. Similarly, if I ask you, we'll all say that it's a pipe, but it's not a pipe. It's a representation. It's a pictorial representation of the pipe. Okay, so I will now quickly go through the equivalence theory, but uh, don't worry, I will not discuss all of them because it is not needed. I will discuss a certain idea, but the main thing is that the equivalence theory is nothing but the perennial debate between liberal translation and literal translation, between sense for sense translation and word by word translation. The same thing, but written in different wordings and from different angles. Okay, so I will not discuss Jean Paul Vinay and Darbelnet, uh, you know, it's not that much required. I will discuss actually ab about two or three uh, important uh, writers on equivalence. One is Jakobsen. The other one is Nida, who has been called the father of equivalence theory. 
and lastly the newest research by anthony pym the only person who is living in the list of equivalence theorists now roman jacobson this particular essay is another very important towering essay in the history of western literature in fact there are so many you know panels and so many research papers are still being published on this idea three ideas that floated by roman jacobson he is a russian person who has actually categorized the act of translation the model of translation into three subdivision and he is saying and this is the second you know translation theorist after dryden who has kind of you know came out of the bifurcation and kind of made a tripartite division of translation what is uh, what are these words number one is intralingual which according to jacobson is nothing but rewording an example say for example you know you all have read beowulf the first english epic right now you all know that it was written in old english and it is very difficult to read in that language so you are you are reading hopefully i'm not very sure but you are reading it in modern english now this is an example of intralingual translation okay where you are translating within the same language it's nothing but rewording interpretation of the verbal signs within the same language sphere you are translating an english text into english text now the second one interlingual which according to jacobson is translation proper you know whenever you think about translation it is actually this interlingual translation that you think of where you are thinking translation as transference of one verbal sign from one language to the other language we all think translation from this interlingual perspective that is why jacobson has termed this particular category as translation proper third one intersemiotic before i explain this let me give an example uh think that you are watching makbul now it's a cinematic representation of macbeth or any other text say for example that you know famous uh, the two states from chetan bhagat's novel to cinema so it 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 you can say that from script to screen film translation is a good you know a good example of intersemiotic translation where you are changing verbal signs into non verbal signs you know that in film there are other types of language there is an audio visual kind of translation that is happening another example is theater translation from page to stage whenever you are say for example that you know you have thought that okay we, you know this time we will uh, play shakespeare's hamlet in our freshers so when you are playing that on stage that textual thing is getting transferred into theatrical signs you are thinking about props scenery you are thinking about light dialogue acting sound all these things make up so all these non verbal sign systems are getting associated within the theatrical paradigm so theater translation and film translation are two easiest examples of intersemiotic translation in order to understand this word you need to know the sign system semiosis etc which i am not going into i'm sure that you know about sasura and etc but for the time being just remember that when you are translating from text to other kind of text you know a, a kind of written text to performing text okay now eugene and ida 
uh, before I explain this, uh, you know, definition, let me start with an example. And this example is uh, taken from NIDA himself. So as you can see that NIDA has written a book called Toward a Science of Translating, 1964, where he has talked about formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence. Now, NIDA is actually a staunch believer of Christianity. He was a, a Protestant Christian and also a Bible translator. Entire life he has translated Bible. Not only that, he has created an, an institution which is still you know, uh, there in, in Italy. It's called NIDA School of Translation Studies, NSTS. And their sole purpose is to translate and disseminate Christian ideology in different languages. Now, say, for example, uh, you know that one of the often quoted line from Bible is Christ is the Lamb of God. You all have read William Blake. So I'm sure that you all have read, you know, Lamb, Tiger. So you know about this very uh, you know, important idea about Christ and Christianity that Christ is the lamb, LMB, lamb of God. Now, you are, you, you have been given a task to translate it into your own language. Now, I do not know Kannada, so I'm not very sure, but I'm sure that there is a Kannada word for LAMB. So you will translate that into your language without any difficulty because the equivalent word the meaning the kannada you know synonym is already there in the dictionary and you are just replacing the word the english word lamb with that kannada word according to nida this is formal equivalence where you are just replacing literally one equivalent with the other and it is already there in the dictionary so you don't have to think much you just open the dictionary and you will replace the word lamb and that is it now nida is saying just that imagine that you have you have been given a task to translate Bible into Icelandic language. Now you all know Iceland, right? And you know that in Iceland, a lamb cannot survive. So there is no lamb in Iceland. So according to formal equivalence, it is not possible to translate lamb in Icelandic language because there is no equivalent word already existing in the language. So there can be two options. Number one, you can write lamb in English and can give a footnote that this is lamb. You can give a picture. You can describe that animal. But the Icelandic people, they cannot relate with that creature because they have never seen such a creature in their experiential world. So they will not understand what is lamp. Therefore, they will not understand that what is the meaning, what is the significance of this particular creature in Christianity. And what is the significance? As we know, lamp stands for meekness. Therefore, it is actually talking about that Christ is a meek animal. Oh, sorry, sorry. Christ is a meek person. Lamb is a meek animal. Christ is a meek person. And this meekness is, a, is one of the founding principles of Christianity. But they will not understand because they have never seen lamb. Therefore, they will not experience this meaning. What is the remedy? And there, NIDA has innovated this idea of dynamic equivalence. What is dynamic equivalence? According to NIDA, first you need to understand the meaning and NIDA is actually taking this concept from Chomsky that every word is a carrier of meaning without meaning there is no word therefore NIDA will ask you first to 
first to analyze the source text. This is using NIDA's model. NIDA will first ask you to analyze and you will say, okay, the analysis is that lamb is a meek animal. Then NIDA will ask you to transfer this meaning into the target language. So your job as a translator is to find out which animal in Icelandic experiential world stands for meekness. And what will you find? You'll find the, the, the creature called sil, silfish. So in Icelandic language, the translation would be Christ is the seal of God. So you are analyzing the meaning of the word. You are transferring that from one language to the other. And then you are restructuring. This is actually latter has been also, you know, other scholars, they have said this is encoding and decoding. Sorry, sorry. Decoding and encoding. You are decoding the source language text, you are analyzing, and then you are encoding, restructuring the meaning into the target language. Now, why NIDA is talking about this? You know, as I have told that NIDA is a Protestant believer. If he was a Catholic, then I'm sure that he wouldn't have said to 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 translate Christ the lamp as the seal. It is not possible because the Orthodox, you know, the Catholics, they will never allow it. But because he is a, he's coming from the Protestant background, NIDA is saying that in order to convey the message, what is more important to convey the message, not the language, I need to spread Christianity. Therefore, the the target audience should understand the philosophy. Therefore, I will translate it accordingly. So analysis, transfer, restructuring, this is all about NIDA. And the last thing about the uh, you know, equivalence theory is Anthony Pym. And Anthony Pym is not talking about anything new. Anthony Pym is actually taking the same principle from NIDA, formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence. So I, I, I just forgot to say that the second process, the analyzing and then restructuring, NIDA has said it as dynamic equivalence. But there is a point that I have not said. Now I will tell you that NIDA, since he is a staunch believer of Christianity, he has also said that, okay, I will appoint another translator who will observe the translation process. How is that possible? So NIDA is saying that, okay, you have translated lamb into seal. Now, just for an example, somebody has analyzed that tiger is a meek animal. For anyone, any ferocious man, can it can be right. The tiger is a meek animal. Now that person can translate it. Christ is the tiger of lamb. It may possible because it's dependent on translator's subjectivity, his interpretation. Now, NIDA was aware of this. So since the sole purpose is Bible, therefore NIDA has said that there will be another kind of a, you know, a thing called backed translation. So he will only sanction that translation where back translation is matching. How is that possible? Say, for example, I, Rindon, has been given the charge to translate Bible in Icelandic language, right? And I have translated lamb as seal. Now, Ilkal sir will be appointed by NIDA to back translate from Icelandic language to English. And Ilkal sir has translated the seal fish as lamb. And since the translation and the back translation are matching each other, NIDA will give permission to my translation. But he has appointed another translator in order to observe the process. Now, say for example, I have translated wrong. I have said that Christ is the tiger of, trans of God. And Ilkal sir has back translated tiger into English. That, you know, the Icelandic tiger into English tiger. It will not match lamb and tiger. Therefore, NIDA will not give permission to my translation. 
So this back transition is something that is extremely important in order to understand NIDA's transition process. Anthony Pym is actually targeting this. Anthony Pym is saying that there is no problem in the entire theory of NIDA. So where lies the problem? According to Anthony Pym, as he explained in Exploding Transition Theories in 2010, that the problem lies in naming. And he is saying, instead of formal equivalence, it should have na been named as natural equivalence because it existed in the nature already. So when you are translating lamb in Kannada language where the word exists, according to Pim, it is naturally exist. Therefore, the translator is just looking at the language and he finds the equivalence and he replaces. So it is already there. It is natural equivalence is something that is already there before the translational act began. It was already there. Lamb equal to that Kannada word. Home equal to a Kannada word. Or home equal to in Hindi, ghar. It was already there. So when you are translating, you are just looking at the language and transfer. So according to Anthony Pym, it's natural equivalence, not formal. Same, second one is, he is saying directional equivalence. Why? Look at this, this picture carefully. Can you see that there is a there is a you know uh, arrow line? So look at this direction. So translation flows from source language to the target language. So it is it is a kind of directional equivalence according to PIM because it is it is going through a direction. It is following a direction from source to target. So according to PIM, it should not be you know, uh, kind of, you know, it should not be termed as uh, direct uh, dynamic equivalence. Rather, it should have been termed as directional equivalence because it is following a direction. This is all from equivalence theory. And I'm, sh you know, stopping the uh, screen share because the PowerPoint is now over. Now I will talk about two more things and it will not take more than 20 minutes. So please bear with me. Number one is that what is the problem of this entire equivalence? Actually, if you see at the entire equivalence or whatever we have talked about, Cicero, Dryden, all these theoreticians, all they are talking about is the product. No one is talking about why the translator has translated, right? Everybody is, you know, after the process on the product, how you have translated, what you have translated, but why you have translated, no translator, uh, no translation studies scholar till now have answered. And this is the thing that has been pointed out by Vermeer, Hans J. Vermeer, H-A-N-S, Hans J. Vermeer, V-E-R-M-E-E-R. He was a German scholar and he has said that, okay, there is no problem in the equivalence theory because it has explained the entire process of translation studies. But we need to understand that before the process begins, there is a reason behind taking the process. Somebody has asked the translator to translate. And you have seen in the entire whatever we have discussed, there are three things, three you know identities we have talked about, author, translator, reader. According to Vermeer, no translation studies scholar has talked about an important identity that is commissioner. Who is commissioning translation? Why the translator, okay, let me start with an example. I, I forgot, I started with the theory. Uh, let me give an example, okay. Say for example, I know uh, Rashmi and uh, Sachin and say Shantosh, as I can see on the screen. Now, think about in, in this manner, that I have written Bible, 
okay i am the author though i know that there is a problem in in that statement but anyway i'm taking the onus now ilkal sir is the commissioner now ilkal sir has asked rashmi to translate bible in kannada word for word for kannada christians so rashmi will translate word for word as it is in the latin so that is and that will be called authentic kannada bible right okay now come to sachin ilkal sir has commissioned sachin that sachin you know the the all the students as a sorry not not student all the childs you know they the all, all the children they they do not understand this complicated idea of the bible so rashmi's bible can cater to the adults adult can understand all this complicated thing so can you please translate it from a children's from a child's perspective can you make a very pictorial kind of a translation so therefore sachin has been commissioned to produce a children's kannada bible number 3 santosh now imagine that santosh is a film director and ilkal sir is a producer ilkal sir has asked santosh to make a kannada movie based on bible now varmier is actually pointing towards this particular issue he is saying that these equivalence theorists they have not addressed this issue they all were very much you know engrossed in how equivalent how similar the target text is towards the source they all are looking back to the source and trying to make a percentage kind of a calculation that how closure the translation is if it is very close they is terming it as a literal translator if it is in a kind of taking a free way they are saying that it's an adaptation but think of about this you know all these translation theories of all these equivalent theoreticians they are coming after the production of the translation they are taking the target text and comparing it with the source and making a kind of a percentage thing but varmier is saying forget about the source answer me why there are multiple translations possible from one single source text and this is the first theory let me you know emphasize on this this is the first theory in the history of western translation which has taken target text as the prominence in, instead of taking source text as a as a base this is called target text oriented translation theory why because this theory is discussing how rashmi has created an authentic bible how sachin has created a children's bible and how santosh has created a film out of the same text and varmier is not looking back to the source but varmier is not comparing rashmi's text how closure it is or santosh's text how closure it is or sachin's how closure, he is not doing that he is rather taking the all these translations and thinking about what purpose they are serving to the target say for example ilkal sir has said rashmi you know i need this bible because there are so many kannada christians who are not getting an authentic bible so varmier will now research on how much rashmi has success has been successful to produce an authentic bible so the so ilkal sir the commissioner the purpose of the commissioner said how much the translator is following 
so the purpose is the sole important thing in this scopos theory s k o p o s it's a it's actually a german word taken from greek s k o p o s mean meant purpose so the entire theory is based on that how shantosh's text has been capturing the audience and how successful it is in terms of its popularity or such in text how many children they feel comfortable in reading such in translation so the 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 purpose set by ilkal sir or the commissioner how much the translators are adhering to the purpose set by the commissioner and why the translator is translated he is trans he or she is translating for something someone is paying the translator right or giving some kind of favor so you know this is the only theory till date i can uh, you know guarantee you that you know vermeer scopos theory is the only theory which has talked about commissioner no theory you know I, I, the pol there is poly system theory deconstruction all these theories nobody has talked about commissioner the importance of commissioner in the whole process of translation nobody has talked about so here i raised the western translation theory i could have you know talked about poly system or you know deconstruction but i think it is enough for you to understand the western theory now let me quickly talk about how this indian notion is so different first of all in the entire lecture of one and half hour that i was giving i mean i'm giving and i'm sure that you all are bored now how many words you have heard from me about this process only two one in in general that is translation the other word that i have used sometimes is adaptation if you if you see all the european languages you will see that the same word translation translation name translator or oh, same to same word exist in all the languages across europe now think about indian perspective and before i start let me say that i am not a you know a huge scholar on on all the indian languages as far as i know i am i'm telling you there is one word called anuvad in sanskrit this word also exist in most of the major indian languages most of the languages are having this word anuvad in bengali we say anubad so the pronunciation may differ but the same word there is another word in sanskrit called rupantar there is another word in uh, assamese called bhangoni to break there is another word called vashantar from one language to the other same sanskrit word is another word called vivartanam in malayalam there is another word called ul urai there is another word called tarjuma in urdu there is another word called chaya in hindi now why in indian languages there are so many words to understand this word this act of translation there is no single word uh, sorry single word across the continent across the subcontinent but similarly you know if you think europe as one nation and all the european languages in the in languages of that same continent there is only one word translation translation because of the diversity of the act that exist in indian languages let me tell you how is it now we all know that who is the writer of ramayana we do not know who is the first writer so there is a concept called ur ramayana valmiki is a writer of one version of sanskrit version of ramayana similarly there is krithivas in bengal 14th century who has translated bengali uh, sorry ramayana in bengali is called krithivasi ramayana then there is tulsidas who has trans you know kind of you know uh trans you can say translated but it's not translation I'll, i'll clarify why but he has also written another text called tulsidasi ramcharitmanas 
there is another text from down south kambaramayana kambaramayana and i am sure that you know that in all the indian languages there are at least one sometimes two ramayanas exist now why there are so many ramayanas number 1 number 2 look at these ramayan writers all these are were called as writers not as translators and that is why they have written their name in front of the ti- in, in front of the text and when we were in school we have never said that tulsidas has translated valmiki's ramayana because there are so many differences say for example this entire you know uh, episode of uh, lakshman rekha was not there in valmiki's ramayana and you all know that kampa ramayana is so different similarly just an for an example since all of you are from english literature background you know that alexander pope a famous 18th century scholar and writer and poet essayist towering figure pope has translated iliad but have we ever referred it as pope's iliad no we have said it pope's translation of homer's iliad who is the writer of iliad only homer others are translators say for example the the theory when we were discussing about dryden i what i said dryden's translation of ovid's metamorphosis have i said the dryden's metamorphosis no why is it so now the answer lies in natya shastra let me quickly clarify there are 10 types of drama according to bharata i am not going into 10 types don't worry about it i will just talk about the first two the first one is natak the second one is prakarana now in the definition of natak varat is saying natak are those where the audience already knew about the story the audience is coming to watch the play knowing the story beforehand example kalidas's avigyanam shakuntalam what is prakarana according to varat where the audience they do not have any idea about the story line because the story has been originated from the writers uh, sorry from the dramatist's mind from the you uh, know uh, the the director's mind for example mrityakatika now interestingly as we all have ed- been educated in western education system which one will go in the top prakarana right because that is original shakuntala as we know is taken from mahabharata is an excerpt from mahabharata but interestingly if you read natya shastra by bharata you will see that bharata is saying natak is the prime category prakarana comes second why according to bharata bharata is clarifying this he is saying that when the audience do not know the story obviously they will you know keep the silence they will be very interested because they do not know the story what is the big deal but when they know the story they know what will happen to shakuntala even then they were sitting for two and a half hours to watch that play of vigyanam shakuntala that is the credit so in indian understanding version comes higher original comes secondary and i have not said this while discussing about western translation western translation always follows author is in the top translator is in the secondary therefore original is the primary translation is the secondary translation has always been categorized in the western concept as a secondary act and that is why there was that famous you know a uh, quotation you all know about this proverb that translators are traitors but in india we have never said this thing rather we have categorized all these people prithivas tulsidas kampa even it it is same with mahabharata it is same with any indian text say for example veda upanishads are actually interpretations of veda but we have never t- treated them as secondary we have treated them as original 
as it is as 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 valmiki so we have never distinguished that valmiki is the superior tulsidas is inferior we have categorized valmiki as author tulsidas also as an author and that is why ak ramanujan has said that you know these are retellings why he is saying that now let me just quickly talk about this term called anuvad you know the term anuvad is anu a n e u plus vad v a d vad mane to speak speech so say for example whatever i am saying now if rajoshri you know is repeating it you know tomorrow it will be anuvad of mine then if mahesh will repeat rajoshi day after tomorrow then that is another anuvad and that is how in pre colonial time indian knowledge system transfers from one place to the other and you will see that no text has said okay valmiki is uh, ramayana is the text and all are secondary no we have given the same importance to tulsidas to kampa to kali krithivas as it is but knowing the fact that you know tulsidas ramayana is a production of bhakti movement and that has been influenced by krithivas ramayana but we have never said that okay this is the primary this is secondary no why because everything were the, the, all these versions were in orality and since everything was in orality which one is authentic who will say so it it depends on interpretation so the way valmiki has interpreted ram and sita same way tulsidas or krithivas they have not treated you know that in valmiki's ramayana he was a, he was a warrior prince in krithivas ramayana and then later in tulsidas in 15th century ram became god because of this bhakti movement but the same way kamparamana if you read kamparamana you'll see that there are differences in terms of understanding ravana now no text has been said that this is the original this is the one anuvad is actually vad you are repeating the vad anuvad and you all know what is the counter speech we say prativad so vad if i am opposing someone's vad say for example if prithivas is opposing valmiki valmiki is his vad prithivas is will be prativad if i am not saying he is opposing i'm just saying for an example anuvad is following the speech prativad is countering the speech speech is vad number 1 number 2 i will not go into all the uh, terminologies but i'm just you know in order to understand the indian notion the other word is rupantar rup mane form or aesthetics antar mane you know to change so to change the form or to change the aesthetics in that way avigyanam shakuntalam by kalidas is a rupantar of mahabharata story why because mahabharata story mahabharata as you know it's it it is a mahakavya it was written in kavya tradition and you know the the uh, the text by kalidas is a natya drama so from a poetic kavya tradition it is transferring to natya tradition to dramatic tradition so the mode of storytelling is getting changed so that is rupantar change in the form but has anybody said that kalidas is an
one is original nobody knows nobody knows which one is the original can we say that valmiki is raman is the original text no if you just read the famous essay by uh, ak ramanujan 300 ramayanas where he has actually talked about this there is no original in indian idea everything is actually somehow related to the other everyone is interpreting the other say for example avinav gupta's avinav bharati is nothing but an interpretation of bharata's natya shastra what is natya shastra do you know that natya shastra is actually called fifth veda it has taken all the you know the the teachings of four vedas why because the shudra and the women they cannot read all these four vedas so bharata is saying that i am creating a fifth veda natya veda where i will you know accumulate all the teachings so and it will be accessible to all the class and all the gender therefore if you read natya shastra you can you have the knowledge of all the vedas so everything is related to the other text everything in in india was intertextual therefore there was no nothing called original and as i have said that in india we have never categorized original as superior or translation as inferior because both the ideas were not present in india everything was version or retelling reinterpretation of the other and lastly i will you know end my lecture with this that these ideas and these explorations of indian idea pre colonial indian ideas of translation studies has also you know kind of uh, influenced the western scholars and jacques derida and there is another person derida's reconstruction you all know so i will not go into it and you all know that there is a strange similarity between the buddhist apoha theory and you know the the uh, derida's idea of reconstruction i'm not going into it there is another person whose name is octavio paz i am not sure that whether you have read his poetry he was also an ambassador he was posted in delhi as an as as an mexican ambassador uh, and uh, he he was also a nobel laureate and he was greatly influenced by indian literature by the way you know a lot of poems he has written based on delhi ha huh. uh, the 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 silence of tomb etc etc there are so many poems by octavio paz on india especially delhi now octavio paz once said that this idea of original as the superior and translation as the inferior as the secondary is not a right thing to say because say for example just you know just think about it that i have written a text okay it's an original text written in bengali now can i say that text as original unless and until somebody say for example nivedita is translating that in kannada so according to paz unless and until a text is getting translated that trans that text will never be called as original so the status of the text written by me as original dependent on nivedita's translation therefore octavio paz has said there is nothing called original everything is translation of a translation of a translation it's a very famous idea in fact he has also said and it's a rather kind of a controversial remark he has said that shakespeare is not an original writer and he is not referring to holinshed's chronicle he is saying i will only consider shakespeare as original writer if i see a single word he has written which has went beyond a to z all the words written by shakespeare is a combination of alphabets english alphabets from a to z so why will i consider shakespeare as an original writer has he gone beyond a to z no so according to pass no writer 
no writer is original every writer has been influenced by the other writer therefore in you know in 1980s during 1980s when susan bassnet is writing the famous book translation studies a reader uh, sorry an introduction to translation studies she is saying about all these ideas and then he she is talking about the cultural turn in translation studies and he she is saying that the problem with translation studies in the beginning was and i have not said this now i'm telling you all the equivalence theorists except anthony pin the last one all the equivalence theorists nida jc catford vinay and darbelnet all of them are coming from linguistics background for a long time translation studies was dominated by linguists then there was a phase of comparatists came who you know after 1980s no 1980s actually around 1970s 1975 there was a discussion going on in america i will discuss that tomorrow uh, where they were talking about the importance of translation and more and more comparatists are coming into translation studies and you know susan bassnet is one of them and you will see that then there is a turn of translation studies because more and more comparatists are getting interested in translation studies say for example susan bassnet or theo hermans or susan bassnet mona baker all of them are coming from literature background from comparatist background and they are changing the they are they are questioning the dominance of linguistics or linguistics you know people in 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 translation and therefore from 1990s you will see that more and more theories are coming from sociological background from cultural background from ecological background etc etc and translation studies has changed a lot from that equivalence based theory that was a source text based translation theory to target text based translation theory in fact now people are not thinking about translation as a textual thing now they have incorporated you know the globalization and a lot many things into translation now everything is being uh, you know interpreted through translation and uh, you know the, the, if you if you just you know quickly search on google you'll see that right after that book that phenomenal book by susan bassnet on translation studies where she has talked about the cultural turn there were so many turn that came there is a turn called translatorial turn in translation studies then you know with with all these you know sociologists like uh, like obus marhai or you know uh, same hanna who has done a phen phenomenal study on shakespeare sociological uh, translation uh, sorry sorry uh, translation of shakespeare in arabic from the sociological background where he has incorporated pierre bourdieu the famous sociologist's idea kobus marai has also taken biosemiotics into translation so therefore you can see that translation studies nowadays is getting you know a lot of scholars from outside the boundary so there are mathematicians you know ecologists you know physicists all are coming into translation studies and translation studies has taken so many turn so many turn and uh, this is the last thing and uh, don't treat it as a you know self advertisement but uh, you know there is a panel that i proposed in 2020 uh, no 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 sorry 2019 actually uh, which got selected in 2020 and you know in this year there will be the seminar uh, where i have proposed a kind of ecological turn in translation studies and all the uh, scholars like douglas robinson and uh, uh, you know the famous comparatist uh, caesar dominicus and uh, then uh, uh, samehana all these people they have written uh, uh, abstracts under my panel and i am hoping that that panel will also talk about something new that will talk about ecological turn which nobody has talked about till date but the point that i'm trying to say that from equivalence studies which is very much linguistics based translation studies translation studies has traversed a long way and uh, i i can also request all of you 
that you know uh, last year uh, in 2020 uh, in university of hyderabad and sri sri university together we did a webinar uh, and the webinar the title of the webinar was transition studies across frontiers where we have invited only those scholars who are actually working on transition studies from different backgrounds. Say, for example, you know, Harish Trivedi talked about translation, the relationship between transition studies and world literature. Rita Kothari talked about transition studies and gender. Then, you know, as I have said, Kobus Marai talked about biosemiotics and translation. Then globalization and transition by, you know, famous Michael Cronin and uh, also the sociological aspect of transition from uh, Same Hanna. All these people, they are actually trying to expand this you know, field of transition studies. And now transition studies, if you just, you know, if you are interested in working in this area, you can search, you know, almost all the universities in Europe and America, as well as in China, they are having transition studies department. Unfortunately, in India, we started transition studies long back. The first center for transition studies in India was in 1989 in University of Hyderabad. But unfortunately, you know, this field has not been, uh, you know, somehow the, the only the linguists got interested in transition studies. But nowadays, a lot of literature people, they are getting interested in transition and more and more uh, centers are coming, more and more uh, departments are coming. But still, I will say that in, in India, transition studies is in a nascent stage. But in, in Europe, you just take uh, any, any British uh, university, any European university, any Chinese university, they have a mandatory transition studies department. That's all. If you have any question, I will be more than happy to answer. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Rindan, for uh, such a marathon lecture. <laughs> yeah, I, I really appreciate the way you involved into and took us to a global journey of translation from both Western perspective and then Indian perspective and the new avenues of translation because so many avenues are opening up now. And then, as you said, eco-translation is also a new concept. And then post-colonial translation is, has also been taken up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, and one more very interesting yeah, I, topic I, I, which you uh, raised mm -hmm. was that mm -hmm. translation of text into adaptation. That also makes a very interesting inquiry, uh, I suppose. And then, uh, yes. There has been also politics of translation, which has been dealt uh, at a lot. But then, having said that, I still believe, and I ask my students as well as my uh, teaching assistant about giving emphasis to our Indian poetics as well as Indian translation. Still, some more lots of work has to be taken up because. Uh, unfortunately, whenever we introduce a translation paper to our PG students, um, the more the inclination is uh, very much towards Western concepts or Western theories of translation. So, so I feel there has to be some uh, a fine balance of both. And uh, I am really, when I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm really thankful to you because I forgot to mention this, uh, which have you have just mentioned two important things I completely forgot to mention. One is the, the idea that you have just said post-colonial transition. And, you know, uh, all of you will be, uh, you know, very happy to know that this idea of post-colonial transition is a joint, was a joint venture by Susan Masnage and Harish Trivedi. Okay. And I will ask all of you to read the introduction mm -hmm. because in the introduction, it's a joint introduction written by Trivedi and Basnet. Hey, sorry, sorry, Trivedi and Susan, huh, Trivedi and Susan Basner, where they were saying about the other ideas of translation. Say, for example, they were talking about translation in the concept of translation in Latin America. And they are saying that how in translation in Latin America, it is completely different, you know, where, you know, kind of 
in in latin america they are approaching translation from a, a colonial india world and how they are looking at it the translation is a, as a, as a kind of a, a kind of insertion of colonial practices into their culture and as you have said rightly said that the other thing that i forgot to say the politics of translation by gayatri spivak where he she has talked about the this idea of politics and the 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 post colonial transition in fact there is another interesting point i i now i remember i that you know when she was translating mahashweta devi's draupadi interestingly the translation is of just eight pages but the introduction that she has written is more than 10 pages around 11 or 12 pages where she is actually foregrounding hard world feminism through the translation of draupadi now interesting point is that how spivak is kind of using you know translation as a method to propagate gender identity gen hard world feminism and how she is manipulating translation into certain way because you know mahashweta has once uh, said against spivak that she has manipulated my work i was never a feminist writer i was a class writer okay. but 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 spivak has you know represented me in the west in such a way that i became a feminist writer and but i am a classical leftist and a classical leftist cannot go beyond the class so you know she has actually asked shomik pandavada the famous theater scholar to translate other works by mahashweta so that people may understand that what is actual in in mahashweta but you know this is the this is the power of translation also sometimes translation can overpower the source so much that the the idea about mahashweta in west as well as in india even in the non bengali speaking world as a feminist writer but which is not true if, you know if you want to know about this you just type mahashweta devi anjum kartial uh, interview where she is talking about the politics of translation that spivak has used again now interestingly spivak is talking about politics of translation but when spivak is translating spivak became more powerful than the source and she is using the translation for her own need now the point is that as you have rightly said that you know there is a, there is an immense possibility of translation studies in india as i have said that you know translation has has so many meaning so many multifarious angles to be dealt on and you have rightly pointed out that all the indian syllabus of translation studies is actually invested with all the western uh, idea that is why i i try to kind of you know balance in between that you know you read the western ideas there is no problem in that but also read the indian concept indian notions of translation that was there in pre colonial time and how these indian notions they got changed through the colonial intervention and then what happened in the post colonial time yeah and uh, if possible we will have some uh, discussion about the commissioner what prompts a translator to translate a text it may be out of choice or it may be out of some purpose or are there any essays on this you was uh, sorry to say uh, this is not my cup of tea translation but then nevertheless i am not a scholar in that but wherein i i i i believe that you are a, you have read a lot in translation as well as in comparative uh, comparative literature which has been your area of research as well as specialization please could you throw some light upon this yeah uh, you can just you know uh, either you can read all the i mean there is a uh, entire uh, kind of you know work translated of vermeer by katharina rays you just need to write uh, katharina rays uh, scopos theory or you can what you can do also this new i mean this uh, recent scholar not recent i would say she is aged but uh, she is still living is christiana nord who has actually contemporized the scopos theory so the the idea is you know or you can also do one thing you can also read uh, that famous book by jeremy monday uh, is the name of the book is introducing translation studies it's a very useful book for any student you know who is just starting translation studies into and it is uh, easily available this book is uh, there 
free copy on Google itself. You don't have to even go to any pirated site. Just write Jeremy Monday introducing translation studies, where he has actually uh, kind of a just a kind of a guidebook. He has uh, clarified all these theories in a very lucid language, and there you will can see all the you know primary articles on Scopo's theory. But the idea is very simple. The idea is you know that in order to understand even in fact you know the you can also think like this that when a translator as you have said that when a translator out of choice translating something then you may think that the translator himself is acting as a commissioner so there is a dual role of commissioner and translator in one body so first he is commissioning himself or herself uh in, in in doing the translation and then she or he is, is doing the translation so but something is kind of sparking him or her to do the translation and now vermeer is actually interested into that yeah, but maybe in 21st century the purpose of translation has been a uh, uh, very tempting one Main, mainly because most of them are uh, doing it for monetary benefit Uh, so they just exactly. go and then just select a list of best sellers and then they <laughs> that prompts them to translate exactly exactly there is a huge market book market lying there yeah. so the moment you know say amish uh, is writing they in english yeah. uh, you know the, the, it is getting translated in all the indian languages then and there i know the translator because my friend has translated it in bengali so okay. there is a huge market and there is another market also of translating indian text in english because there is a huge market lying there in the west in america yeah. where there are so many south asian studies department and you have seen that the famous translator orunavo sinha who translates mm -hmm. almost on everyday basis who is getting published almost on everyday basis because of this you know huge market of translation of indian languages say for example recently as you know that shibrama parikkal and uh, mini krishnan they together they translated the first kannada novel i forgot the name uh, in in english and it got published by oxford university press so all these you know big presses in oxford university press cambridge university press and as well as indian press like katha huh, or the sahitya academy they are also translating so only th th there is a need for them but also you cannot deny the market and the market is actually first conceptualized by scopo's theoretician and then i which i have not i couldn't talk is polysystem theory it's a very interesting theory you can uh, search on net it's by two scholars from uh, you know israel itamar even zohar and gideon turi uh, who has is, is actually you know they were uh thinking about translation from the quantitative analysis when mm -hmm. actually what they were doing they were uh, say for uh, okay forget about uh, their languages just think about indian languages say for example when the colonial uh, time is starting 19th century we have seen that so many english novels getting translated into indian languages so the flow of translation was from english to indian languages then what happened bankim chandra wrote the first english novel and then he shifted to bengali and then he started writing novels in bengali for the first time in india and then it influenced all the other indian writers uh, you know say for example in odisha fakir mohan senapati in, in kannada in all the indian languages bankim was a huge influencer now everybody was you know then translating the you know bankim and then sharat chandra in indian languages in kannada in malayalam etc so the flow of translation then became from bengali to other indian languages and then in other indian languages this you know the this uh, genre of novel writing started and then there was so many original writers so itamar even zohar and gideon turi they have actually traced this idea that how translation influences original writing say for example lyric you know gita galu uh, the, the 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 famous uh, i forgot the exact name kannada gita galu uh, which is actually the translation of the famous english book uh, i forgot that the famous english anthology of poems so 
that geeta galu as far as i uh, came to know from parikal sir because he has worked on that he said that that geeta galu actually influenced kannada lyric writing and lyricist and uh, the, the, uh, the poet uh, the poets yes yeah, shikanta ya is it shikanta ya yeah yeah, sh- yeah exactly shikanta el ha huh? so the how the, so the entire policy system theory is actually based on that that how a foreign canon is getting imported through translation and then through translation it is influencing the so the the target language or another example i can give you from english language literature which will be relevant more in your department that is you know say for example sonnet the tradition of sonnet now we all know that petrarca francesca petrarca is the first writer in uh, sonnet in latin and in english what and sare these two you know uh, writers the uh, lyricists they were translating petrarch and through translation this genre of sonnet writing came into england and then it actually gave birth to all the original writers of sonnet say for example sydney spencer shakespeare and then on now sydney he was very much dependent on words translation of petrarch so this canon entirely imported through translation and then it actually accelerated into original writing it has happened in across languages across language in fact this idea of sonnet writing was not was not new in in, in latin it was actually there in france before okay uh, and and th- that is how the, the you can trace the entire you know trajectory of sonnet writing in europe but the point that i'm trying to say that how canons say for example novel it was completely a uh, colonial import in india it was no, never there because we had what we had is katha Let's say for example katha sarit sagar or kadambari is uh, uh, kadambari by banbhatta all these are katha but mainly we had natya and kavya we didn't have this novel tradition at all so that yeah. is why we didn't have any 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 equivalent words initially oh, we yeah. actually created you know those words okay. yeah and then in uh, my college minutes it was the first time that uh, yeah the the foundation of post colonial uh, translation was laid wherein they mm-hmm. proposed a uh, 1 lakh rupees for uh, uh, to encourage translation isn't exactly. it yeah. exactly exactly there were yeah. so many translation works going on in the colonial time mm. so translation was one of the main activities in the colonial time and then the post colonial time also in nation making also you need translation True. so when a language is is in is in a weak position or is in a in a in a very uh, regional language will always uh, get influenced by the major languages through translation we all know how the sanskrit texts they travel to other indian languages through translation through the act of translation though you, we need to remember that the concept of translation was something difficult something completely uh, you know uh, difficult uh, sorry something completely different than the other than the western counterpart so the western idea of translation is something different the indian uh, concept of translation is something different yeah i am a thought provoking and uh, an exhaustive one. and then uh, with your kind permission if you permit me rindan i have my own uh, youtube channel which i have created if you permit me shall i i would like to upload this lecture over there yeah yeah yeah, Definitely. yeah because Definitely. most of the listeners will be fa- facilitated yeah yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah fine yeah thank you for uh, almost sparing your valuable time for our students and then uh, uh, on behalf of my students and then my research scholar renuka desai as well as an invited guest nivedita madam she is a, a senior lecturer in government college down uh, gere she has also joined joined here and then there is one question by my research scholar uh, shall i uh, yes 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 so her question is can you please throw some light on the principles and tradition of translation Uh, especially uh, in poetry translation related to the translation from regional language into english language uh, shall i uh, shall i paste it on yeah, the chat yeah. box i yeah, think yeah, it is there is uh, it visible to you yes it is visible just just a moment i am 
Uh, just a second. Uh, may I? I'm mean, I'm a little. Uh, I don't know. I, mean, I have never seen this. Uh, there is some uh, poll that came. Uh, is it? Was it visible also? Uh, that there is a poll result. Also. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I had only launched it. It's a very new <laughs> thing. I, I have never seen it. It's a very new thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I was I, initially. I thought that is if something that there is a problem. No, you, you can screen. expect that from me because I am a bit tech savvy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> See, a hundred percent excellent. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank. You. I, I was just you know looking at it. Okay. Acha, just a second. Let me also. To read the question again. Can you please throw some light on the principles of learning? Pardon? Uh, okay. Uh, so as I can see, uh, see first of all, there are so many work done on poetry translation. You know, Robert Frost. You have heard of him. Robert Frost has once commented that the most difficult thing in translation is actually translation of poetry. But the point is that there is no specific theory. Related to poetry translation as such, but yes, there are so many problems that been diagnosed and you know uh, kind of you know foregrounded by theoreticians on poetry translation. Number one, the most important point in poetry is that you need to keep the form as well as meaning intact. Now, how will you do that? Say, for example. If I ask you to translate a sonnet, a Shakespearean sonnet in Kannada, now how will you maintain the rhyme scheme? It is extremely difficult because English and you know Kannada they are not coming from the same language tree. You may do the same in in case of say Kannada and Malayalam or Kannada and Tamil, but it it may be possible. Even then, it is very hard to do. But you may try. But when there are two different language you know languages on two different trees it is very difficult to maintain the 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 rhyme scheme now say for example that you maintain the rhyme scheme what will happen inevitably you will lose the meaning now therefore there is there is very there, there are so many experiments done by you know uh, different uh, writer uh, sorry different translators poets etc now one of the theory is that Uh, though i do not subscribe to that but there is a kind of understanding amongst a lot of scholars that poetry is something which a poet can best translate okay a poet because he or she himself knows about all the rhyme scheme all the meters etc etc poetic idea etc metaphor he or she is the best a poet is the best person to translate poetry but then there is another problem because let me clarify how it is you all know about jean you know uh, all know about baudelaire the famous uh, french you know poet there is uh, he has written the famous uh, book uh, le fleau du mal the flowers of evil now it got translated in bengali by two persons okay now one is a poet a very very famous poet actually he is the first person to introduce comparative literature in india buddhode uh, bosho but what he has done since he himself is a poet he has made baudelaire's poetry as it is as as, as if that it is written by buddhadev bosho himself so the poetry does not carry the all the traits and you know symbols of baudelaire he has completely changed it he has kind of indigenized it importantly another thing is you know he didn't know french so therefore what he has translated is from english translation now there is another person who is a very famous french translator orun mitro now orun mitro also translated baudelaire but his translation is more akin to the original but he is not a great poet like uddhav bosho so therefore it is very difficult you know sometimes in or in in translation of poetry okay and you know you have seen that uh, there has been say for example bachana poetry uh, ilkal sir has actually talked about akka mahadev i had 
uh, bachanas poetry by all these bachanakars in my syllabus and i have seen you know even ak ramanujan the greatest translator one of the greatest translator in in india even he struggled a lot to translate kannada bachana poetry in english though i consider that translation as one of the best translation in india it is you know i always show that translation as an exam example but he himself has said that it it was so difficult because all the and if you, I, i am sure that you all have read that book the 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 the, the, the book of shiva i forgot the name of the book um, by ak ramanujan on this vachana poetry translation of vachana poetry where in the introduction he has said about this that it is very difficult to translate all these indian ideas the speaking of shiva right? speaking of shiva yeah. speaking of shiva so, so if you read the the previous we will understand that in fact if you read the another very important translation uh, by p lal of all the ancient sanskrit drama from sanskrit to english and who is actually the originator of the word called trans creation pilal purushottam lal and he has also written about it in the preface of that book ancient you know sanskrit drama i do did have that book but that is in kolkata so i could have showed that book but it's a great it, the name of the book is great sanskrit plays just read the preface of it where he has introduced this term uh, you know trans creation which later he has explored and he has written another book a very tiny book on on it where he has said that you know in order to translate indian literature in english which is a foreign language you need to do trans creation so translation and creation together so there is no such you know uh, particular principle or tradi uh, you know the translation theory related only to poetry but uh, yes there are so many you know writers or scholars they have talked about it poetry translation is something that is the extreme difficult uh, because it it ha it has certain you know structure which you cannot change but some some you know writers they what they have done they have uh, in order to maintain the the, the meaning they have written it in prose they have said that i i try to maintain the meaning of it for me the meaning is more important than the form so they have translated it as a prose our and 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 in the, on the other hand some people say that uh, for us is since it's a poetry therefore the form is more important so even if i have to you know kind of compromise with the uh, meaning i ha i have done it okay and uh, thank you so much for sparing your valuable time once again and on behalf of my colleague my colleagues and then my students my research scholar and invited guests uh, from the core of my heart i thank you very much and then uh, tomorrow uh, i would like to inform the audience that uh, Uh, we will be uh, Rindan will be once again engaging a thought provoking session for all of us, and then it will uh, it will be on comparative literature, comparative studies, and then uh, I um, tomorrow most probably I may be out of station. Rindan, can we have in the evening if it okay. is or if it is convenient to you, or you you let me know. Uh Uh, can can you please repeat? Uh, I can. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow I am a bit out of station, so uh -huh. I will be traveling. So you please tell me if you could, if we could have it in the evening. Or or 